Social conformity and non-conformity are two contrasting concepts that play a significant role in shaping our human behavior. Conformity refers to the tendency of individuals adjusting their thoughts, beliefs and behaviors to align with the expectations of society. On the other hand, non-conformity doesn't simply mean rejecting these societal norms and beliefs, but rather creating our own. The non-conformist adopts values and ideas that stem from personal experience and thus have personal utility. In many cases, these things could also happen to be socially accepted norms, but the adoption process is different. A non-conformist verifies what he adopts and doesn't just copy society. This definition is important because the aim here is not to glorify social outcasts and people who reject society's values, but rather to argue that we should be the only decision makers when it comes to choosing our values and opinions. In today's world, people largely prefer belonging to an idea or a group rather than standing out as a unique individual in the crowd. This preference for conformity can be attributed to several factors, such as the need for acceptance, the fear of rejection, and the desire for a sense of identity and belonging. Indeed, this can be useful because it helps us integrate into society, maintain social bonds and form new relationships. However, too much conformity can deny us of our power and uniqueness, which could be detrimental to our mental health. Excessive conformity could lead to losing ourselves and simply becoming a number or part of the crowd. To be yourself in a world that is constantly trying to make you something else is the greatest accomplishment. Ralph Waldo Emerson To live a meaningful life, it is essential that we pay attention to our uniqueness instead of just blindly conforming to the crowd. So in this video, we will explore together the reasons people tend to conform to society and the importance of non-conformity to living a meaningful life. Since we're talking about conformity, the first very striking and important example is Solomon Ash's experiment. These experiments revealed the degree to which a person's own opinions are influenced by those of a group. Ash found that people were willing to ignore reality and give an incorrect answer to conform to the rest of the group. Using a line judgment task, Ash put a naive participant in the room with seven confederates. The confederates had agreed in advance what the responses would be when presented with the line task. The group was then gathered in a classroom and shown two cards, the first with one line and the second with three lines on it. Each student was then asked to say out loud which line in the second card matched the first one. The group was seated in such a way that allowed the actors to respond first, leaving the real participant to respond last. The results of the experiment were quite shocking in terms of individuals choosing to conform rather than say the truth. 72% conformed to the majority at least once, and 5% completely succumbed to peer pressure and always gave the obviously wrong answer. This experiment clearly showed how much people fear standing out and fear being ridiculed. It shows to what extent people go to avoid being labeled as different. In 1955, Ash famously said, the tendency to conformity in our society is so strong that reasonably intelligent and well-meaning young people are willing to call white black. This is a matter of concern. It raises questions about our ways of education and about the values that guide our conduct. I personally believe that these findings raise many questions because I think that the situation has only gotten much worse since the experiment in the 50s. Today, with the prevalence of social media, with a few clicks, we can already get very easily our social conduct. Social media tells us what to think, how to behave, what to wear and what to like and what to dislike. Everything can be dictated by social media. The problem with that is that it creates a generation that doesn't have to think anymore at all and just executes. So by definition, we're very obedient. We don't question anything and we just take everything as a given. It is like this because they said so. And this reasoning is very limiting. So one might ask, what makes people conform to the extent of erasing their opinions and their perception? And what makes people go with the voice of the majority instead of their own? To answer this question, we need to go back to the process of socialization. Socialization is the process through which individuals become members of society. It includes acquiring knowledge, attitudes, beliefs and values necessary to function within a society. Socialization begins at birth 
and continues throughout our lives. This is simply the process of learning from other people. From an early age, we learn everything from our parents, our family, and then when we grow up a little from our peers in school. So the first introduction to our society happens by mimicking others, looking for their behaviors, for the way they speak, for their words. This is simply how an infant internalizes and learns everything in society. When we grow up, we find ourselves fully immersed in what Emile Durkheim, the father of sociology called the collective consciousness. This simply refers to all the shared beliefs, values, and moral attitudes that exist within a society. It represents the collective understanding of what is considered right, wrong, acceptable, or unacceptable. Durkheim argued that conformity to these social norms is essential for maintaining social order cohesion and integration. The problem here is that this assimilation process starts with a pure intention to integrate into society, but unfortunately ends up by erasing people's voices and opinions. Society becomes our reference point and the voice of the majority always takes the upper hand. Being part of society is being part of a group and that entails being a follower. We're all conditioned to follow this reasoning from a young age since this is the rewarded behavior in any institution, such as school, work, or family. According to a study conducted by two psychologists in the 50s, Morton Dutch and Harold Jared, people conform for two main reasons. The first is normative social influence, which refers to individuals who conform to fit in a group and be accepted. The second is informational social influence, which refers to individuals who conform when they lack knowledge in a certain situation. So for example, if they don't know what to do, they copy others. These findings are considered situational reasons, meaning that we might choose to conform in a specific set of circumstances. However, conformity can also come from a more global approach, an existentialist approach. So it doesn't necessarily concern a situation, but just a general mindset that we adopt in our lives. And this is where Ernest Becker's book come in very handy and is very pertinent for our discussion. The Denial of Death, written by Ernest Becker, is a work of psychology and philosophy that explores the concept of death and how it shapes human behavior. So Becker argues that death is a fundamental element of human existence and that it could be a source of great anxiety, just like the existentialist philosophers put it, such as Kierkegaard, Nietzsche or Camus. So to cope with this anxiety, the first reflex we have is to engage in immortality projects that will be meaningful to us and that will transcend our mortality. Something bigger than us, more meaningful than our existence, that's the only way to ease our fear of death. Traditionally speaking, cultures did so by offering people ways to identify with higher realities such as a god, an afterlife, or a unity with the cosmos itself. This often happened through shared rituals and beliefs. Since that is not the case anymore in our secular societies, we tend to look for other ways to satisfy our need for death denial. This quest of finding meaning is qualified as heroic pursuit by the author. He makes a clear distinction between different types of pursuits. There's the path of the non-conformist or the personal heroism path, and the path of the conformist, which is also called societal or cultural heroism. So now we have two distinctions, either the personal heroism and the cultural heroism. The non-conformist thrives to find his unique potential and his personal calling to engage in this process of creation. He puts all his attention on one immortality project. The objective of this project is to reassure him that we will spiritually outlive our physical bodies. This project could be a work of art, a business idea, or an academic pursuit. Whatever that may be, it needs to be coming from within and chosen by us and not simply dictated by society. This path also requires a lot of courage. In Rollo May's book, The Courage to Create, he argues that any creative process will never be an easy road. It will be filled with obstacles, anxieties, and frustrations. We must have the courage to go through this process in order to reveal our true potential and manage to create something of value. Rollo May said, the opposite of courage in our society is not cowardice, it is conformity. Conformity here is very clearly an opponent to this creative process. Conformity is considered taking the easy and secure path. Since the creative process requires courage to face anxiety, many people give up on the endeavor altogether and choose the conformist path. The conformist path refers to the adoption of predetermined social roles. This is social heroism. This involves taking a place that already exists, fulfilling a role that most probably would be fulfilled with or without you. So basically, this is an impersonal role. This could be a banker, a scientist, a democrat, whatever it 
it is, it is not personal. This makes us merge into a cultural idea. It grounds our existence and makes us feel real. It gives us a place in society. Even though it is less valuable than a personal endeavor, it still numbs the fear of death we all have. It helps us cope with the fear of death because we'd be contributing to something bigger than ourselves, bigger than our existence. And that gives us a temporary and maybe full sense of fulfillment and security. So if you look at both solutions and you ask yourself, which one should I choose or which one is better? The short answer is you should choose the one that stimulates your individuality, the one that makes you special and the one that doesn't simply make you part of the crowd or just a number. Choosing the conformity path is secure and stable. However, in exchange, we give up our most prized possession, our uniqueness. If you look at our educational system in most countries, it doesn't promote uniqueness but rather promotes the standard path of corporate life, commonly known as the rat race. We are conditioned to become employees and work for people instead of working on ourselves or for ourselves. Many people automatically set their creative potential aside and focus on getting a good job to live comfortably. And the ones who don't, often have a hard time justifying their choice. The comfort and security provided by a stable job that pays the bills is the worst drug we can have because it kills our drive to create and innovate. By opting for security, we stop trying new things, we stop failing and making mistakes, and thus we stop learning anything new. If there is no sense of urgency to do something, we often won't do it. This is what stability and comfort deprive us of. Urgency. It is crucial to understand this message with an open mind and nuance the arguments. This is not simply criticizing the standard corporate life. The message here is much bigger than that, and much bigger than work. Our careers and jobs are just a concrete example of the mindset shift between a conformist and a non-conformist. As I mentioned before in the previous videos, I have a corporate job as a sales rep and I do consider it to be a necessary step for the time being. However, I don't see it as an end goal, but rather as a mean to an end. I don't try to create any exceptional fulfillment from my job or make it an integral part of my personality. I just see it as an important task that needs to be done in order for me to do what I love. The surest way to corrupt a youth is to instruct him to hold and hire his team those who think alike than those who think differently. Nietzsche considered that encouraging conformity can lead to moral and intellectual corruption of the youth. When we promote group thinking, we suppress innovation and critical thinking. Progress comes from thinking outside of the box instead of thinking like everyone else. He suggests that by indoctrinating young minds into uniform thinking, we not only stifle their intellectual growth, but also compromise their ethical development. The herd mentality is simply being like everyone else and losing access to our precious uniqueness. You can be like everyone else, have a decent job, do the same activities and retire like society planned for you. Or you can be different, follow your passions, develop critical thinking and only engage in meaningful activities. We all know exactly what we need to do to live a meaningful life. The problem is that we're often afraid of what other people might think. Kierkegaard said, The greatest hazard of all, losing oneself, can occur very quietly in the world, as if it were nothing at all. We lose ourselves when we don't have an aim and simply follow someone else's. We lose ourselves when we robotically go through our daily lives without intentionally making our actions meaningful. We lose ourselves when we prefer to sedate our existential fear with comfort instead of courage. The message here is to look inside yourself, see what you love and follow it. The only way to stand out in a world full of clones is to pursue something you love, something that makes you unique, something that makes you yourself. I think this message is extremely pertinent today in the age of social media because everything has become extremely polarizing. It's either black or white, it's you're with us or with them. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on us to choose a side and thus making us become something we don't want to become. It's crucial to strike a balance within ourselves. While conforming to societal norms can lead us to lose our individuality, being too non-conformist can make it hard for us to fit in. The same applies to society as a whole. A society full of conformists may not be able to evolve and innovate, while a society full of non-conformists may struggle to find peace and harmony. It is important to maintain a balance between conformity and non-conformity. I think that's a key to a healthy 
wealthy individual in society. The message is not black and white, and it shouldn't be taken as black and white. If you take this message as a truth, then it beats the purpose of the whole video, and you're just conforming to an external message. Analyze it, understand it, and make your own idea out of it. The most important thing is that you acknowledge this reality and you do with this message as you will. However, it is important to note that nonconformity should not be pursued for the sake of rebellion. It should be a conscious decision that aligns with one's values and principles. As Voltaire said, dare to think for yourself. Thank you for watching.